All right, we've come to the most important part of our worship service where we turn to this book, the Bible. We prepare to listen to what it is that God wants to say to us today. And for that reason, I encourage you to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're talking about the Christian principles for work and money. And once again, we'll be looking at verses 9 through 12 as we comb the depths of what it is that God wants for us in both work and money. Now, as we begin, uh, I want to begin with what I've considered our creedal text for this series, which is Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, which say this. Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. Those are such good things to remember, and now we'll dive into our scripture passage for today. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 9 through 12. But we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other. For God himself has taught you to love one another. Indeed, you already show your love for all the believers throughout Macedonia. Even so, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you to love them even more. Make it your goal to live a quiet life minding your own business and working with your hands, just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not believers will respect the way you live, and you will not need to depend on others. Now, we're studying together what I'm calling the Christian principles for work and money, and one of the things I want to do is just remind you that these Christian principles, this way in which we serve Christ, flows out of the gospel, The main message of this passage is the importance of loving each other. And Paul says, we don't need to write to you about loving each other, for God himself has taught you to love one another. And here, I just want this to be so clear, sin, salvation, service. We were people who were lost in sin. We were cut off from God. In fact, we were his enemies. His judgment was upon us, and there was nothing we could do. Uh, We were... We were bound to die. There was nothing we could do to to please God or or fundamentally make ourselves right with him. We were totally lost. Salvation, sin, salvation, service. But God in his love and in his mercy uh, entered into this world in the person of Jesus Christ. God the Father sent God the Son. Jesus took on human flesh. He, He communicated himself to us in the most understandable of ways. He was qualified through his life to be our Savior. And on the cross, God put our sins on Jesus, punished him in our place. He died, which is the punishment we deserved. In order that, having been raised from the dead, he too can raise us to new life. Sin, salvation, and if we've been saved from sin, now we begin to serve him with our life. You know, our relationships are different. Our inner psyche is different. But, but now, especially this, our approach to work, our approach to life in general is going to be different. So far, we've talked about five principles. And I want you to see they're all part of Christian service. The first is the principle of the goodness of work. We see that God himself was the first laborer, the first worker that he blesses and he gives and he works and he labors on our behalf. And so as a result, since we're created in his image and we're redeemed to be like him, we too, we we find goodness in work. The principle of giver's gain. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. God is a giver. He has designed this world so that givers gain and takers lose. The third principle, we've said that we're going to seek to provide more value than you receive in return. That's what it means, giver's gain. In every situation, I'm going to give more than I take. I'm going to provide more than I receive back. Uh, This is what it means to be a Christian. We're always seeking to do that. And to extend the network of our relationships, we're going to use our work, the talents, the gifts that God's given us to, to be on mission. The same way God was on a mission to save us, Since we've now been saved, we're on a mission. And one of the ways that we can establish new relationships and show the love of God is by the work that we're called to do. The fifth principle that we talked about last time was simply this, mind your own business. Rather than 
what our culture does is get up into other people's business. We're gonna mind and rehearse and practice ourselves, the things that are, are true about us. We're gonna learn who we are. We're gonna learn who we are in light of who God is. And then we're gonna get better and better stewards of the resources and talents, personality and gifts and abilities that God has given us so that we can truly serve others better. Now, out of the general principle of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, this principle of loving one another, we then have four specific actions that we're supposed to take, and it's out of these four specific actions that we're drawing our principles. The first action is love even more. We're not gonna be content to just love the small circle of people that are around us. We're on mission with God to love even more. We're gonna make it our ambition to lead a quiet life. That's action number two. We're not gonna live loud lives or all about me, 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 look at me, look at me. We're gonna quietly serve others, bless others, live for others. Action number three, mind your own business. Like I said, we're gonna rehearse the things that are true about ourselves. We're gonna realize who we are in light of who God is. And then we're gonna pay attention to the unique talents and gifts and skills that God's given us and get better and better at what we do. Instead of getting up in other people's business, trying to improve their lives, we're gonna try to improve our own for the sake of love. And now the fourth action. Verse 11 says that we're to work with our own hands. And um, this action of the four is unique because uh, Paul then follows it up and he says, just as we instructed you before. And I wanna just pay attention to this, that of course when Paul first came to Thessalonica, when he carried out his mission there, that he instructed the people to, to work, to labor, to do something tangible with their hands, to not just live lives of leisure or be idle, but to be at work. That was the instruction that he gave them when he was first there. Now in this letter, 1 Thessalonians, he's repeating that. He's saying, look, uh, I want you to, to live quiet lives, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands just as we had already instructed you. So now this is the second time. And I just want you to be aware that when you get to 2 Thessalonians, Paul one more time talks about this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 10 say this. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right for such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. So not once, not twice, but three times. Paul says this is so important. You've got to labor, you've got to work with your hands, do something tangible. Um, if you don't, you, you shouldn't even be allowed to eat. That's what he finally says. Now what's going on here, uh, probably it's important for us to talk about the culture of Thessalonica and the larger Greco-Roman world, which was actually a culture that was built on the ideal of leisure. They had this idea that work was low and menial and that if you had any kind of life that was worthwhile, you'd You'd rise above work and have a life of leisure. In fact, I found this quote from Aristotle. He wrote, happiness seems to depend on leisure. We work in order to enjoy leisure, just as we make war to enjoy peace. You know, nobody wants to go to war, but it's sometimes necessary for peace. Nobody wants to work, he said. Uh, the true happiness is the leisure. Um, you can see in the attitude of Aristotle that, that work is to be disdained. Leisure, now that's the life. I also found this great quote about Plato. 
Plato himself indicated that a well-governed city should be maintained by the rural work of the slaves and by the artisanal work of men of little note in order to sustain the virtuous lives whose fundamental characteristic was leisure. You say uh, this was the ideal at the time. If you were a slave or if you had, you know, the life where you had to work, then I guess that's your terrible lot. But if you were a citizen of the Greco-Roman world and you had the ability to do it, then of course the thing you should do is you should live off of those people who have to work and enjoy a life of leisure. That was the Greco-Roman culture at the time. Perhaps, I mean, the ideal of leisure we even find in our culture today. But Paul's point was simply this, no. You know, God, he, he wants us to be a laborer, to be a worker, to bless, to serve, to use the gifts, talents, and abilities that he's given us. And, and our rule, which we laid down when we were there, which I'm repeating now, and in fact, which you'll repeat a third time in 2 Thessalonians is this, that we are to, to work. That is the ideal. And that now leads us to what I'm calling our sixth principle. It's so important. You are a producer slash creator, not merely a consumer. Boy, I hope you understand that you're a, you're a producer and a creator, not merely a consumer. Now, listen, as we dive into this, uh, I just want to say this, that how you think about and refer to yourself is really very important because it'll begin to, to change your whole paradigm or thought process about yourself. I'll give you an example for, for men. If you constantly refer to your wife as the old ball and chain, I mean, maybe you say it as a joke around your friends at first, but if you keep that up, you keep referring to her as the old ball and chain, pretty soon that's gonna change the way in which fundamentally you're thinking about your wife. And the reason I bring that up is that it's important that you not refer to your wife that way, and it's important how you even think about or refer to yourself. And uh, what I'm saying is that you should not think of yourself as a consumer. Now, I know in our culture that uh, being a consumer is like a bedrock principle. In fact, uh, you'll hear people say this all the time, that we have a consumer culture. In fact, there are magazines like Consumer Reports to have us, help us navigate our consumer culture. But man, don't allow yourself to think of yourself as merely a consumer. Even animals aren't net consumers. I mean, if an animal was a net consumer, a farmer wouldn't keep it. Like, as an example, and I don't know how much it actually costs, but say it costs $300 uh, in hay and feed to uh, feed a cow every single year. Uh, the reason you do that is because it probably produces, let's say, $1,200 worth of milk and butter and cheese and cream. Otherwise, you wouldn't keep that cow. Even a cow is not a net consumer. And now, certainly this, active, busy, creative people produce so much more value than the food they eat and the shelter they occupy. We are far from net consumers. Even the pay that people earn at their job doesn't come close to the value of what they really produce. In fact, we've been saying this all the way along, part of the extra value that people create, uh, it, it benefits their employer. We've been saying that you should provide more value than you receive in return. That's a Christian way. And so if you're being paid $25 an hour, hopefully your, your employer is receiving $50 worth an hour of value. Uh, you've got to produce way more. You will produce more value than you consume. That's the reason that employers hire you. We are not fundamentally consumers. We're producers. I came across this interesting article by William Nordhaus, who's a Yale economics professor, who tried to quantify you know, the way in which people produce and consume, and this is his analysis. He wrote, for countries at all income levels, the annuitized shadow price of a person comes out to about 30% of per capita gross domestic product. Well, maybe that's a mindful, here's what he's saying. He's saying that we produce about three times more every year 
than we consume. And, um, you know, as you read this article, he took a lot of things into account, the public buildings that we occupy, the homes we live in, the food we eat. And he says, uh, on average, if you take the entire world of low-income producing people, high-income producing people, in all these different countries, he said, a human being tends to produce three times more than they consume. Their consumption is only about 30% of their per capita gross domestic product. Humans are not takers by our created nature. We only become that way as a result of the sin and fall, only to the extent that we've become bent towards something else. Do we think it's about me, 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 and I'll take, 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 and I'll live for leisure, and I'll have others do for me. I won't do for anyone else. Listen, we do far better as givers. I mean, just only one example. Most parents are very reluctant to be a burden on their children. Uh, and man, if there's anyone that we should feel that we have the right to be a burden on, I mean, you think of all the years that you spent raising them and feeding them and clothing them, providing shelter for them. They took, took, took. If there's anyone you think, well, I should get something in return. But no, most parents are happy and proud to have taken care of their children. And they really don't like the thought of needing their children to later take care of them. All that points to this simple idea that we are by nature far happier as givers than takers. Listen, even in the process of buying things, uh, we don't subtract value, we don't take value away. Even in the process of buying things, we add value. Here, come along with me. So I'm standing outside of Fleet Feet, which is the place I often come to buy shoes. And the reason I'm here is I wanna show you and demonstrate that when I purchase something, I'm not a consumer as though I'm taking things away. I'm actually giving and producing value. Here, maybe you can think about it this way. Let's say I go inside and I buy shoes for $80. Now, if you think about the entire process, somewhere in the background, there's a company that is the shoe-making company. They make shoes. And let's just suppose that for an $80 pair of shoes, there's $20 worth of material that at some point they had. They had cloth and rubber and thread, and they put it all together, and they used their work and ingenuity and the process that they developed, and they created the shoe. Well, there was a store like Fleet Feet then that came and bought the shoe from the manufacturer. Perhaps uh, they bought it for $40. You know, the $20 of material plus the work that was put in, they buy it for $40. And of course, now they're gonna display it. They're, they've got a wide selection. They, they uh, put it on display. They advertise to customers. They bring people like me to the store. And uh, what cost them $40, they now sell for $80. And of course, when I walk away with the shoes, I'm happy because I now have a new pair of shoes. And I just want you to see that far from consuming and taking, just the interaction I had where I purchased the shoes for $80, it produced something, it created. So let's just think about after the transaction, what everyone had. At first, the shoemaker had $20 worth of materials. Now they have $40, which came from the store. The store once had $40, which they used to buy the shoes, but now because of this interaction, they have $80. I once had $80, but now I have something more valuable, at least to me, if it was less valuable, I wouldn't have bought it. I have a nice new pair of shoes. Well, what is the value of those shoes? Perhaps we'd look at it this way, what would I sell them for? You know, if someone walked up to me right after I bought the shoes and said, hey, can I buy those for $80? I'd say, no way. I mean, I wanted these shoes and I just went through the effort to get them. Uh, maybe the person would say, how about 100 or finally 120? And maybe, at least for me, maybe at $120, I'd think to myself, well, the effort of going back to the shoe store, uh, I'd get $40, I'd, I'd make that back. So maybe now, at least to me, I have something that's $120 value. And here's the point. At first, the shoemaker had 20, the store had 40, I had 80, that's $140. But now the shoemaker has 40, the store has my 80, 
and I have 120, which means that now, just because of the interaction, we all together have $240 worth of value. Why is that? Well, it's because God made it. So that when we interacted with each other, when we served each other, when we blessed each other, that value is created, wealth is produced. You see, we're not consumers as though we're taking away from others. We're producers, we're creators, even when we buy things. So you see, even in the process of buying things, we're creators, we're adding value. We're not taking it away, we're not consumers, we're producers and creators. That is the principle we're talking about. And man, this is, I know it's a countercultural message. I, I understand that. And I just, I think about all the simple ways in which this message seeps into everyday life. I can even think about simple things like attending church in our culture. You know, our, our culture uses words like this. You're a church shopper. The assumption is that you're a consumer, that you go to church to, to get something, to consume things, to take things for yourselves, but no. Listen, if you're a Christian, don't think of yourself as a, a consumeristic Christian or a church shopper. You're not going to church to get something. You're here to give something. You're here to produce, to create, to be part of something. You're on mission with other people to give something of eternal value to the world don't allow yourself to slip into the mindset of thinking, I'm a net consumer. You are a producer. You are a creator. And that's why Paul says, you've got to work with your hands. You've got to labor, just as we've been telling you, not once, not twice, but three times. Uh, be someone who produces and who creates, not someone who just looks to take and to get. So that's the sixth principle. You're a producer, creator, not merely a consumer. And now I wanna spend some time, and this of course all just flows out of the gospel. The very first consequence of these four actions is that people who are not believers will respect the way you live. That if you serve Christ in this way, if you seek to be a giver, not a taker, if you provide more value than you receive in return, if you extend the network of your relationships, if you seek to be a producer, creator, not merely a consumer, if you live according to these principles, then people who are not believers, they'll watch on, they'll say, wow, I might not understand their doctrine, I might not understand you know, all the things they believe and why they believe them, I might not even agree with some things, but wow, there is something about the way they live that I respect, that I want, that I'm drawn to. And that leads to what I'm calling the seventh principle of work and money. And it's simply this, have the courage to stand out. Um, listen, our, in our culture, so often we just wanna blend in. We don't want anyone to, to notice us. And in some ways that's that's good, we don't wanna live loud lives drawing attention to ourselves, but then on the other hand, don't just try to blend into our culture. Uh, in fact, this is the way I like to put it, we need to shine like stars. And I like to have this talk, shine like stars talk with Christians, telling them to have the courage, be weird, stand out, let your light shine for Christ. In Philippians chapter two, we find these verses, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. Listen, uh, how do stars shine? Well, against the backdrop of a dark sky. Uh, the background of our life is a crooked and depraved generation. There's a way in which people live. They live in darkness, but not you. If God has loved you, if he sent his son into your life, if he's changed you from the inside out, if his light is now in you, you don't hide that light under a bushel. You don't put it in a corner. You put it up on a stand, and you've got to shine like stars. And um, that's such a great image because stars, there's two things about them. First of all, they contrast against the darkness of the night sky. When you see a star, it's brilliant white light is just totally different than all the, all the things that surround it. And also there's something compelling 
and attractive about a way a star shines. I know when I see the first star of the night, my eyes are just drawn to it like, wow, look at that. And I think that's what Paul is saying about our lives. There's supposed to be something that's compelling, different and compelling and attractive about us. Here, let's talk about it this way. We just list the ways our culture are and how we're supposed to live different and compelling. So in our culture, we live for me, me, me. Everyone is. Everything's about me, and I'm self-centered, and I'm self-oriented, and everyone's that way. Christians are called to be different. We've been talking about the principle of giver's gain, and I'm just encouraging you, if, if you have received from Christ the fact that God sent his son and gave him on your behalf, then you can't live for me, me, me. And so we're gonna live for others. We're gonna love God and love others. Now, in our culture, it's, it's a pessimistic culture. And uh, we spend so much time tearing others down. In fact, one of the ways to get ahead is to stomp on others. That's how our culture works. But Christians are called to be different because of what Christ has done. Uh, we're supposed to live lives that encourage others and build others up. When we see other people, we don't want them to go down. We want them to go up. We want more of them and less of us. Listen, with regard to finances and money, our culture is in debt, we're stressed out, we're broke all the time, but Christians are called to live a different way. God's given us principles of how to live on our finances and we're supposed to be faithful stewards of what God's given us. Our culture is superficial. It's what I call an amusement culture. And I, I love that word amusement. To muse is to think. Amuse is to not think. That's what our culture is. You know, listen, if you have problems, our culture tells you just, you know, listen to music or go to a theme park. I mean, just take your mind off it. But that's not what Christians say. We're not superficial. We don't avoid the difficult issues. Uh, Christians all the time are encouraged to think, to be deep, to consider what's substantial and real and true. Don't settle for pat answers. Uh, dig down in and discover what this life is about. Our world is a world where you can't trust anyone, where everyone, you, you've got to just, you know, look out of the corner of your eye because you never know who's going to stab you or tear you down. But Christians don't live that way. We're trustworthy. We're honest. We're people of character. You can count on us. I was just speaking with a business owner this week who talked about the cost in his business of not being able to trust people and, um, you know, how wonderful business would be if you just could take people at their word. Well, Christians do that. We have character and we stand by what we say and we, we try to live lives of, of honesty. And boy, that brings value to people like you can't believe. Our culture is grudge holding, revenge seeking and violent. Yet Christians are people who, who practice forgiveness and compassion and peace. Our culture is arrogant and self-interested. We practice humility and self-giving love and I just want you to see this. It's so different than the way of the world. Our world is a crooked and depraved generation. It's like there's darkness and we stand out. We don't just blend in. We're not just following with the crown. Uh, have the courage to stand out. If Christ's light is shining in your heart, then be willing to shine your light out into the world. Be willing to be weird. Be willing to be different. Uh, be willing not to just blend in with our culture, but be transformed, not conform to the ways of this world, but to live God's way for his purpose. We've been saved from our sin, and now we're called to serve him. And as we do, may it be not only that we're different, but that there's something compelling about us so that non-believers will respect the way we live, and may that especially be true in the way in which we work and conduct ourselves in our lives, in our business, in the way we use our gifts, our talents, and our abilities to bless, to serve, to give, and ultimately to shine God's love to everyone around us. That is the seventh principle. Be willing, be daring to stand out. Well, I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that this message has touched you in a deep place. Probably, if you're not a Christian, you've seen that there are Christians who, who really are concerned to live in a compelling way. And 
even as you've thought about that, perhaps there's something compelling that you're drawn to. Maybe there's a way in which Jesus has been speaking to you, and if so, I just want to encourage you to trust in him, to accept the salvation and the forgiveness that he has for you. And um, listen, no matter who you are, whether you're receiving Christ for the first time or you're rededicating your life and service to him today, I'd encourage you that if you heard God speak to you in a special way, to let us know by texting this number and uh, telling us what it is that you've heard God say to you today and how your life has changed as a result. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Amen. Again, thank you so much for joining us today for worship. We hope that you've been blessed and that you now want to be a blessing. The idea is this, that Christ's light has shined in our heart and now we're to be the light of the world, to shine who Christ is in this dark world. And I pray that as you go out to serve him, that you go with this blessing. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus, may the love of God and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve him. Thanks so much for viewing this sermon. I hope you enjoyed it. For more content like this, please subscribe below and I'll see you next time.